Hey everybody, welcome back. We're going over all of the most important topics you will need to know by the time that you finish MBME 26. We ended last time talking about hepatitis A, and now we're gonna talk about ADHD real quick. So ADHD, you know these symptoms, especially been watching my videos for a while. Easily distracted, moving, and it interrupts. They'll have trouble completing tests in school typically, and so stimulants work really well for these kiddos and sometimes adults increasingly. Thought to be a dopamine epinephrine dysregulation at its core. So this affects the prefrontal cortex activity due to a catecholamine imbalance. Dopamine reward sensitivity impulse control norepinephrine. It's gonna be alertness and attention span. A comorbidity is oppositional defiant disorder. Learning disorders, anxiety. You give them methylphenidate, also amphetamines, and what does that do? It'll block the reuptake, which and an increase the release of norepinephrine and dopamine. Second line is atomoxetine, it's a selected norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Also clonidine and guanfacine, which are alpha two agonists. So ADHD is the underreactive frontostriatal circuits, including the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, deficient dopamine. Here's our practice question: Ten year old boy reprimanded for fidgeting, blurting out, so interrupting, failing to complete, constantly talking, trouble sitting. Totally symptomatic for ADHD. What medication mechanism is appropriate? Increased release of dopamine and norepinephrine. Serotonin reuptake inhibition. That's SSRIs. Those are used to treat depression and anxiety, not ADHD. Dopamine antagonism. That's used in psychosis. That would worsen his ADHD. Voltage-gated calcium. That is not used for your neuropsych. GABA receptor activation. So those are your benzos. Those are sedating. So it's going to be a different mechanism. That's a low concentration of oxygen in the blood. And hypercapnia. ICO2 with a normal gradient here. So respiratory depression hypoventilation, normal gradient, diffusion's intact. The O2 gets into the capillaries just fine. It's just CNS depressant. So barbiturates are going to act on the GABA-A chloride channels, and there's not like a shunt or a VQ mismatch. And so your AA gradient is going to be normal because there's no like diffusion defect. It's just your barbs are going to prolong the GABA-A channel opening. And the way I want you to think of that is barb, it's think of durates, even though it's spelled with a T, barbs because that's the duration. So barbidurations, they prolong that duration. So it causes respiratory acidosis because of the buildup of CO2. That's CO2 retention, normal AA gradient. So here's our practice question. 32-year-old woman is found unconscious. She took phenobarbital acid. That's because of the CO2 normal gradient. It's going to be depressed respiratory drive. Filling would be like pneumonia, which would have an increased gradient. Shunting, increased gradient. VQ, increased gradient. That's like a pulmonary embolism Adelect and diffusion impairment, increased gradient. Big thing here is know the VQ mismatch is like a pulmonary embolism or atelectasis, and the shunting will bypass the lungs. So, barbiturates, normal AA gradient. That's what I want you to know past your first test on this MBME. All right, we're gonna start to go a little bit quicker because we're getting the hang of things. 68 year old woman, worsening knee, knee pain, increasing with walking, improving with rest, bony swelling of the distal and proximal. It's gonna be osteoarthritis, it's gonna be cartilage degradation. So, osteoarthritis is a mechanical degeneration of the cartilage. It's not autoimmune, that'd be rheumatoid arthritis. You'd see inflammatory joints, increased white blood cells in the synovial fluid. It's not crystal deposition, that's gout or pseudogout, that have inflammatory profile in the synovial. Not septic because the white blood cell count would be very, very high. Also, you'd have pain at rest and definitely not normal aging because that does not cause pain or joint narrowing. So aching knees that scream when during the stairs but then they hush when you're restful. That's osteoarthritis. So it's the middle age destruction of the joint cartilage. So the buzzwords are worsens with activity, relieved by rest. Joint space narrowing is huge for that. Dip and pip, big one here being the dip. So wear and tear degeneration is associated as well with obesity, aging, trauma. There's also a genetic component as well. So you get the mechanical stress, chondrocyte dysfunction causes the upregulation of metalloproteinase. So metalloproteinases are involved in the destruction of cartilage and arthritic joints. And so because of those metalloproteinases, you have cartilage loss and you get the formation of osteocytes in the dip. Last practice question, 70 year old woman, gradually worsening pain in the knee, worsens after walking the dog, feels better after sitting. Bony enlargement of the knee and also crepitus, 180 white blood cell. What's the diagnosis? It's going to be osteoarthritis. It's not gout. That'd be your negatively B fringe crystals. Rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory, and it would be symmetric. Autoimmune stuff is symmetric. Septic, acute hot, also 180. That's nowhere near 50K. Pseudogout is positively B fringed crystals. So I think of it as positive. Anyways, helps me. Osteoarthritis is the number one joint disease in the world. It's all about the wear and tear. So if the joint pain gets worse with movement and the x ray shows bone spurs and you have that space loss and a normal fluid and also dip involvement, it's totally totally going to be osteoarthritis. So there you go. That's what I need you guys to know. For MBME 26, by the time you complete it, definitely th know this concept. Next, I just want to explain this one to you. So stroke volume is EDV minus ESP and diastolic minus systolic. So what do you think happens if you shorten the diastolic filling time? Well, this goes down, so that goes down too. This is, so the stroke volume is small. So on an ECG or whatever, I'm just rough sketching this. Oh my gosh, that looks like friggin' flutter. Let's pretend this is normal. If we were to shorten this phase, 
then our stroke volume would go down because we just don't have a lot of time to get this EDV super big, which contributes to the stroke volume. Especially if you have what's called a PVC, premature ventricular contraction, then you'll have a lower stroke volume. Typically, you also have a widened QRS and absent P wave. But the main idea here, what I need you to know is that the filling phase is important for the stroke volume. That's all you need to know. So practice question 59, dude, minor chest trauma, multiple PVCs, followed by compensatory pause. What's observed? decreased stroke volume. Premature ventricular contraction, so you're reducing the stroke volume. That's it. That's all you need to know. So we kind of wrapped up that topic. Next, if something smells fishy, what is it? Bacterial vaginosis, clue cells, epithelium. Boom. That's all you need to know to answer this question. If you want some extra stuff, you should know that it's related to Gardnerella vaginalis. Sexual activity, obviously. And you treat it with metro. So you think of how metros are like super dirty and full of bacteria. Metro is like a metro. And this one, you don't need to treat the partner. So the mechanism for bacterial vaginosis, which is what we're covering here, this fishy clue cell epithelial basic metro treated thing. The mechanism is you have Gardnerella. Ooh, it's going to whiff. Note that this is not an STI, but it is linked if you have new partners, so you don't have to treat the partner. But if they've had a bunch of new partners, that's worth considering for this. Okay, so practice question, 32-year-old woman, four-day, sexually active with a new partner, thin gray adherent, Look at that pH, woof, with test, treated with oral metro, malodorous discharge, basic bacterial vaginosis. Boom, done. Okay, some trap answers. Oral fluconazole, yeast infection, septriaxin for gonorrhea, thromycin for chlamydia, you always need to treat it. So if vaginal discharge smells like a fish market, then you're not dealing with yeast or an STI, it's bacterial vaginosis caused by the over overgrowth of Gardnerella. It's going to be amine production, so clue cells, epithelial, fishy, that's all there is to it. Bada bang, anatomy, everybody loves it. Let's talk about the ulnar nerve, okay, just this one. Fine motor control of your digits and sensation to the fourth and fifth. So you see numbness to the ring and small thing, it's going to be sensory. Also interosseal muscle weakness to the loss of finger abduction or adduction so the interosseous is damaged this isn't a hanging or attraction injury so whatever stretch is your lower trunk cat1 so let's do practice question 17 gymnast difficulty holding onto bars decreased grip strength and sensation in the medial hand what motor de deficit to inability to abduct the fingers so here we have an ulnar nerve injury loss of the abduction adduction due to the interossea dysfunction due to a weak grip numbness in a ring and small fingers makes you think of that and then you think of the interosseous and then boom got it wrist extension that's the radial thumb opposition median biceps muscular cutaneous c5 c6 not related thumb extension radial wrist and thumb radial so your pinky and ring go numb after you're hanging from the monkey bars you should think oh we got an ulnar nerve stretch that nerve controls the fine motor skills of the hand especially abducting and adducting your fingers and that's all we need to know about that next high yield for your first MBME, or rather what I want you to have learned by the time you finish, according to me, penetrating chest trauma. So let's say you get stabbed. I've seen this before. This woman got like seven stab wounds in the, she was wailing. I had no idea. She was doing great. I would have been much worse. Than that. that was a crazy night of the year. It's, uh, yeah, anyways, penetrating chest trauma, tracheal deviation. That's gonna, it's gonna be a tension pneumothorax and it's gonna be hyper resonance, absent breath sounds. So the tracheal deviation is away from the lesion, absent breath sounds for the collapsed lung. So here's our practice question. 25 year old dude stabbed in the left chest, hypotensive, tachycardic, decreased breath sounds and deviation to the right. What are you gonna see over the left? Hyper resonant percussion. So the trachea is deviating to the right and so it's tension pneumothorax. And that means on the left side, we've got that air trapping. Percussion, that'd be a pleural fusion. Finney is with pneumonia. Increased tactile fermentis is solid lung, not a collapsed one. And inspiratory would be pulmonary edema or fibrosis. Now, if we know this idea, then I feel confident. Basically, we have the left side. That's the injured side here in this question. Breath sounds. Now, percussion on the left side is hyper resonant because you have excess air in that space, right? So you, you got stabbed. All that air is coming in. So hyper resonant. You're also going to have some resonance on this side. It's that air. It's a tension pneumothorax because the tracheal deviation contralaterally. And the fremitus, that's decreased. Why? Because it's air. And so the fremitus does not pass well through air. It's going to be normal on the other side though. So this is the side that has the air in it. And so you boom, it moves over your trachea deviation. And that's going to be over on this side. So you have the normal and resonant side on the right, but on the left, all that air is here. So you have decreased fremitus. Trapped air in the plural, space on the left, lung collapse, no breath sounds, but it's hyper resonant and decreased fremitus. But the right is normal until the mediastinal shift like makes it really problematic. So that's that. Let's talk about generalized anxiety disorder. Comorbid with depression, somatic symptoms. It's caused by hyperactivity of the amygdala. Prefrontal cortex fails to inhibit the worrying. And so the solution here from like an ethics and managing as a physician sort of perspective is going to be structured boundaries. So these are the people who are going to call you all the time. Be like, hey, doctor, what about this? I already talked to you about this. What about this? What about this? Super anxious. So it responds well to skeletal structure. Like, hey, let's call and do, do this two weeks later. So we got a 43-year-old woman, ASGAD, frequently calls the office, what are we going to do? We're going to establish regular appointment intervals and uh, limit the phone contact. So here we just need boundaries. Don't refer to psychiatrists as premature or ignore the calls. Don't involve the family unnecessarily and don't suggest uh, changing doctors. That'll just trigger abandonment problems. These are people who call their doctors dozens of times each week. 
So this is kind of like more of an ethics idea. Do no harm, right? So don't cause a problem where it's unneeded. And the best way to treat God is just stability of structure and boundaries. Okay. So that's like a little ethics tidbit there. We're going to do one more question. We kind of blitz through these next 10 topics. So there's this thing called ADP-induced platelet activation. So it's when we have the P2Y12 receptor. And that's our drug target of clopidogrel. It's going to block your ADP-mediated platelet aggregation. So ADP initiates that, that positive feedback loop that locks the platelets into place. The best way to go over this is with the practice question. So here we go. 34-year-old woman undergoes platelet function testing. Her platelet-rich plasma is exposed to different agonist and light transfer. Addition of the compound has rapid and irreversible aggregation mediated through a G protein, increasing the expression of this in the protein surface, GP2B3A, which substance is added, adenosine diphosphate. So here's how we think about this. ADP triggers platelet aggregation by binding to these receptors. That stimulates GP2B3AA expression. And what does that do? Promotes fibrinogen binding and irreversible aggregation. So other answers that are wrong, like thromboxane, that's going to be a arachidonic acid pathway. Collagen is involved in adhesion, not aggregation. Collagen, think more adhesion. Norepinephrine, I would not be associating this with platelet testing. Serotonin is a very weak platelet aggregator. You need that ADP to stimulate. So think about it this way. A single molecule ADP, that's the key to turning sluggish platelets into clotting dynamos. Boom, it's clotting time. So when ADP hits the scene, it binds in P2Y12 receptors. Now this guy locks it in place. It's gonna lock in the platelets with fibrinogen. So ADP is a rapid irreversible aggregation agent, and it's gonna attack this druggable receptor. It's gonna be blocked by clopidogrel, and you assess this by seeing the aggregation, and the downstream activation is, of course, GB2B3A. You can remember this by saying, aggregate them platelets. So remember, the pathway is boom, shika, boom, shika, boom. Look at all these topics we've covered together, guys. So one of the last things I wanted to tell you about this ADP is, again, we said the mechanism is ADP binds to this druggable P2Y12 receptor activating GP2B3A. He's quite the guy. He's the fi final common pathway for platelet aggregation. So think of this guy as the bridge, the Fibrinogen bridge. It's a link between platelets, binding effect of the fibrinogen. And this is actually how a lot of like different drugs work. Bam. These guys are going to be antagonists. So they use in coronary artery syndrome or acute coronary syndrome to block this aggregation. So fibrinogen is this guy's ligand. It's necessary for the cross-linking. Boom, boom, cross-linking happens. Okay, so last question. Five-year-old boy, frequent nosebleeds. He bruises, has prolonged bleeding time, deficiency, what is best explaining his disorder? It's deficiency in the platelet glycoprotein. It's Glanzman's. They can't bind fibrinogen. Normal risk to seed response. So it's not adhesion. It's aggregation. Seed is how you test von Willebrand factor, by the way. You'd get an abnormal test there. Bernard Cillier is defective adhesion as well. So GP1B is Bernard Cillier. This is Glanzman. It's a different mechanism. B, S, two letters, and I think GP. One B. So I remember BS because it's like, it does not aggregate to ristocetin. And so it's not corrected by addition of normal plasma. So you give it plasma and it's like, oop, did not correct. BS, you did not have von Willebrand's. Now I just want to end with this little speech. Imagine a crowd of people trying to hold hands, but they've got slippery gloves on. No matter how much they want to link up, it just won't happen unless they have strong Velcro. GP2B3A. The platelet receptor binds for and cross links, locking them into a hemostatic plug without it. In Glanzman's, you get bleeding despite the normal platelet, platelet count. So when the board asks about absent platelet aggregation with all agonists except ristocetin, it's going to be this deficiency. And there's a nice little gift there telling you to subscribe. But just one last thing, Bernard Toulier syndrome. What I want you to think of this is, yeah, the BS thing I told you does not correct with plasma, but also large. Think of large platelets. So ristocetin induces von Willebrand factor to GP1B. Ristocetin's like, hey, von Willebrand, go bind. You can do it. Go bind with this guy. But if there's none of this, then no aggregation can occur. So it's autosomal recessive. Also, you should think of like ITP where you have autoantibodies, this guy with ITP. And so instead, you have to activate the spleen. So von Willebrand's shows abnormal recessetin, but there, the problem is not here. The problem is here for von Willebrand's. That's why it's von Willebrand's. So basically, big platelets, decreased 1B, could be immune-mediated thrombocytopenia due to GP1B antibodies, Bernard Silly. All right, folks, hopefully this is helpful. This is kind of fun. We're going to fill up this whole map. Just like and subscribe. Just chill, watch this playlist while doing the dishes, while doing some push-ups, and you will learn everything that you need to have learned by the time you finish your first MBME exam. Like and subscribe. Hey, this thing in the back here, this thing lights up whenever you guys like and subscribe. 
Like literally, I'm programming it right now with some Python scripts. So it queries the API key that I have set up with my YouTube channel. And it literally goes, bing, this person subscribed. And it keeps me motivated. So if you want to light up this room of my house, then like and subscribe. Let's try to keep the comments and likes equal. Leave a comment. Tell me what you learned. Good luck studying. You guys got this. You can do it. Take it easy on yourself.